They're going to talk about um, uh, to different communities across the country and I'm going to fight hard to bring them to our riding as well because it passes through a small portion of our community. Um, and they're going to be talking to Canadians from coast to coast that are affected by this to get their feedback and their concerns. Um, I'm going to, like I said, be fighting to get them to come to our community. But in addition to that, uh, we're going to be putting in place um, measures to put a price on carbon. So there are some people who say, well, uh, there's going to be additional uh, emissions from this pipeline, from any expansion or any additional way that we're going to get oil to international markets. What are we going to do about the greenhouse gas emissions? Well, we're proud of the fact that over the last year, we've put in place a national uh, plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're investing record amounts to ensure that we're working with provinces to create alternative energies, um, to ensure that we're slowly but surely weaning ourselves off our dependence on fossil fuels. And third, we're putting a national price on carbon. So we're pricing pollution. Uh, and that's important because what it'll do is it'll ensure that market mechanisms are in place to put a cost on carbon and that money will not be coming to the federal government. That's the final note on this question. The money is actually going to be collected by the federal government and given back to each province so that they can decide what they want to do with those funds. Whether they want to reinvest and give it back to uh, families that need it most uh, who are going to be impacted by any increase whatsoever in the cost of goods or they can invest in technologies to ensure that they're creating new industries in their provinces and building uh, good paying jobs uh, while we make that transition. So um, thank you, Michael, for that question. I hope that answers uh, every aspect of it. Um, the next question that I want to get to right away is actually along the same lines. Uh, C'est en français, c'est une question qui est posée par Suzanne de vaudreuil dorion La question est la suivante. Si la population de votre circonscription est majoritairement contre Energy Est, quelle serait votre position et quelles seront les possibilités que vous puissiez vous objecter? Mais pour commencer, merci beaucoup pour votre question. Um, durant la campagne électorale, j'ai été très clair en dire que je veux être un voix très fort pour notre communauté et pour assurer que quand ça vient à une décision qui va être prise sur Énergie Est, je vais être sûr que je partage avec mes collègues, avec le premier ministre, avec tous les ministres, euh, tous les, les enjeux, toutes les, les questions qui ont été posées par notre communauté et d'être sûr que je travaille avec le gouvernement euh, ou les MRC, les municipalités, les groupes communautaires pour mettre en place des, des, des idées pour minimiser tous les impacts environnementaux. Ça, c'est le job principal à faire maintenant. Comme je viens juste d'expliquer en anglais, on a un processus qui va commencer bientôt. Ça va être un, un comité de trois personnes qui vont euh, avoir euh, la chance de traverser le pays pour parler avec les communautés comme vaudreuil soulange pour faire des études, pour voir euh, tous les problèmes qui, qui peuvent être présents avec ce projet, pour voir, comme j'ai dit, tous les défis, tous les enjeux qui sont importants, toutes les questions qui, ont, qui sont posées par le, le public. Ça va être eux de faire tout ça et de soumettre un rapport au gouvernement fédéral, d'abord nous, le premier ministre de cabinet. Um, et ça va être nous, à ce point-là, après 21 mois, de analyser le rapport et de prendre une décision. Et à ce point-là, nous, en tant, que, en tant que gouvernement, on va avoir six mois pour analyser le rapport, pour avoir des discussions et pour prendre une décision finale. Euh, la deuxième partie de votre question, c'est que si notre communauté est contre Énergie Est, qu'est-ce que je vais faire? Mais je vais être très clair, je vais être clair avec le gouvernement que notre communauté est contre le projet. Je vais être clair euh, pour expliquer les raisons euh, pour qu'on est contre le projet. Et je ne vais pas changer mon idée. Euh, le job principal de tous les députés et le premier ministre est le premier à dire c'est de représenter les valeurs, les intérêts de no notre communauté, notre propre circonscription. Et c'est ma job principale. Um, S'il y a des gens qui sont euh, avec nous ce soir, qui euh, sont en train de nous écouter, qui veulent faire partie de discussion, je vous encourage euh, de euh, venir me voir et de faire partie de notre groupe euh, environnemental que j'ai formé. Il y a à peu près 30 à 40 personnes euh, qui je rencontre une fois par trois ou quatre mois pour parler des enjeux environnementaux qui sont importants pour notre communauté. Euh, je vous encourage à, à faire partie de ce comité. Euh, ça me donne la chance d'expliquer toutes les décisions qui sont prises par notre gouvernement 
et aussi de euh, laisser les, les citoyens euh, de me poser des questions et euh, ça me donne la chance de répondre. Euh, D'abord, je vous encourage, euh, si vous êtes avec nous ce soir, euh, de euh, venir nous joindre à, à ces rencontres et je vais demander à mon équipe de euh, mettre mon courriel sur Facebook et vous pouvez nous euh, envoyer un message pour, euh, pour euh, savoir comment vous pouvez faire partie de euh, cette comité. D'abord, merci beaucoup encore pour votre question. Uh, third question of the evening um, is in regards to healthcare. Um, my question is from Tanya in St. Lazare. This is the question she poses. My question is why are healthcare services being canceled because doctors can no longer charge service fees? I can't get a vaccine from my doctor's office and friends who are cancer patients can no longer get an ultrasound at private clinics. Why are we patients being punished for this and how can, we, how can this situation be corrected? Um, well, first of all, thank you very much, Tanya, for that question. I want to preface that question by just pointing out that uh, healthcare is an issue that's very important to me. It's personal. Um, I'm very uh, pleased at the fact that you brought up specifically ultrasounds because uh, many of you know this already. I was diagnosed with cancer many years ago. Uh, I was re-diagnosed with cancer um, five years ago. I had to undergo surgery and uh, go through chemotherapy. But the good news is that five years later, I've just been given the all clear. Um, The one thing that my doctor has suggested that I continue to do is ultrasounds. So instead of CT scans, I now need to go out and get ultrasounds. And it's the first time I received a referral for an ultrasound. And um, I actually went to the clinic, tried to get uh, a, uh, an appointment two months ago. And I've been fighting for two months to try and get an appointment, only to be told that they will not be taking appointments until the situation is rectified with uh, the provincial government. So from a personal standpoint, I completely understand the frustration. What I want to say about this is there are two key components of the work that the provincial governments do. Um, one of them is education, so the provinces are principally responsible for education. The other is healthcare. These are two files that are incredibly important to the everyday lives of Canadians. Our job as the federal government is not to impose onto those areas of jurisdiction but to always try and work with provinces to see how we can help um, make sure that the services that they're offering are the best possible services. So, many years ago, and you may be aware of this, the federal government uh, worked with the provinces to create healthcare transfer payments. And there were formulas set up where uh, under the previous government, so actually Paul Martin's government, there was increases of roughly 6% per year that were given to provinces. And um, that was to keep in line with all of the increases in healthcare expenditures that the provinces were incurring. When we took office, we pledged to do everything we could to provide support to provinces, more support than ever before, and we're following through on that promise. And I want to give you some examples. What we've pledged to do is to increase by 3% all of the funding that we give to the provincial governments. So that represents $1 billion dollars more per year that we're pledging to the provincial governments uh, to ensure that they can uh, help pay for the rising cost of healthcare and hopefully alleviate some of the situations that we're experiencing, particularly in Quebec, with the fact that uh, some of us now can't get ultrasounds that we, we badly need. The other thing that we've done is that we've Uh, pledged $11.5 billion dollars in new money for two key things that we need. Mental health care, which is, uh, you know, as we're moving forward, uh, we're realizing that we are underfunding, that we're not giving the kind of attention that it deserves, but also um, home care. So that extra $11.5 billion dollars is going to go specifically for those two aspects. And the $1 billion dollars that we've pledged, which represents a 3% increase, is going to be uh, given to all of the expenditures of the, the healthcare system. And that's the hope is that that will help provide the assistance that the provinces need to be able to deliver uh, quality healthcare from coast to coast to coast. Um, so far, we've actually been able to achieve some agreements with uh, provinces. We wanted to have a national framework, but at the first meeting that we had with all the provincial ministers, all of the different demands were different. There wasn't really a consensus there. So uh, we're going with a more individual approach and we're meeting with provinces individually. So far, I believe we've gotten agreements with New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Nunavut, Newfoundland, Saskatchewan. If I'm forgetting one, I apologize, but I think that's where we've gotten so far in the last couple of months. But we're very confident that we're going to have the agreements in place with the other provinces, including Quebec, 
uh, shortly. So thank you very much for that question. Um, and uh, if I have any updates on that, I'll be sure to, uh, to send them your way. We have your contact information, so I'll be sure to give you an update of when the agreement is signed with the Quebec government and what exactly that looks like. So thank you very much, Tanya, uh, for that question. Uh, I have another question here that's health related and it's for, uh, actually we've received a bunch of these. We, how many, we received over 10 of these questions. Uh, so obviously it's something that is important to everyone. So um, the question is this, uh, it's in regards to health and dental benefits. Um, the Prime Minister, uh, will the Prime Minister be taxing health and dental benefits in the 2017 budget? That's a very good question. Um, we don't know how this got started, but there's uh, people talking, uh, and it kind of made its way through social media, and I started to get letters, and we've received a bunch of questions about this already, um, about whether or not the Prime Minister was going to, uh, and the Finance Minister were going to include a tax on dental and health benefits in the 2017 budget. Uh, it actually got so much momentum that the Prime Minister actually last week uh, stood up in the House of Commons and categorically stated that there will not be a tax in the 2017 budget on health and dental benefits. Uh, our, our goal as, um, as the government, which has been something that we spoke about prior to the election, during the election, and now in power, is to try and ensure that we're doing everything we can to support middle class families and those working hard to join the middle class. Uh, we've done a lot of that so far. We've cut taxes for middle class families, which will put an average of about uh, $560 in the pockets of the average family extra. Um, we've increased the Canada Child Benefit so that nine in 10 families will now receive more money than they were receiving before, um, which is a great thing. It's also gonna lift 40% of, uh, projected to lift 40% of um, children in Canada out of poverty, uh, which is a huge investment that I'm incredibly proud of. Uh, so all the things that we're doing are trying to ensure that we're giving, we're putting more money back in the pockets of Canadians uh, and we're ensuring that we have a strong middle class and we're giving the best possible opportunity for those who are trying to join the middle class to be able to do so. So thank you very much uh, for that question. Merci. Uh, je pense que c'est important pour moi de traduire cette question parce que uh, on a reçu des questions en français sur le même sujet. Uh, je voulais savoir si on va mettre, uh, on va imposer un tax sur les régimes de soins de santé et de soins dentaires dans notre budget 2017. Uh, je peux confirmer ce soir parce que c'était déjà confirmé par le premier ministre le 1er février dans les chambres de communes durant la période des questions, qu'on ne va pas mettre un, un nouveau taxe sur euh, le, les régimes de soins de santé et les régimes dentaires. Um, D'abord, merci encore pour la question. Uh, OK, what do we have here? OK, we have a question from Brianna in St. Lazare. The question is in regards to... Um, electoral reform. The Liberals promised 2015 would be the last election to be held under the first past the post system. With today's announcement that you are no longer pushing for electoral reform, uh, this government is, is, is the government not breaking its promise that matter to many Canadians. Uh, how can you justify this change? Brianna, thank you very much for asking that question. This one was definitely a question that we received by a lot of people as well. Um, the last year has been one where we've really tried to engage as much as possible with Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Um, we hosted town halls as MPs to talk about electoral reform. Um, the ministers also hosted town halls. The minister herself at the time, Marianne Monsef, uh, met with groups all across the country to talk about this. Um, in addition to that, as a House of Commons, in the House of Commons, we formed an electoral reform committee that was, had representatives from all of the different parties on it. The goal of that committee was to travel across the country and meet with Canadians to gauge their support for electoral reform, uh, look into, uh, if there was support, what would be the options available to us, and is there a consensus or broad support for one particular um, uh, way of voting over another, and would we as a government be able to impose that change in the House of Commons, or should we, or should we leave it to a... Um, a referendum, a national referendum, if you will. Then, once that was completed, the committee submitted a report, and the minister at the time launched an online uh, website that asked Canadians for their opinions, uh, asked a whole slew of questions to gauge their interest in one, um, one direction or another. The reality is that, unfortunately, there wasn't a broad consensus on what was the best way to move forward. So the report that was given back to us by the Electoral Reform Committee um, 
didn't have a clear indication of which direction we should be taking. Uh, it also didn't, it, it proposed a referendum, but didn't give what the question would look like. And there are a couple of issues with that and challenges with that, because you can imagine asking people to vote, asking Canadians to vote as to whether or not they want electoral reform, while at the same time asking them what different model of electoral reform, whether it's uh, uh, proportional representation or uh, preferential balloting or all of the other options that existed or a hybrid of those um, at the same time. So there were a lot of challenges that were posed by the fact that we didn't have the clear question. We knew based on the, the uh, town halls that we ourselves hosted across the country as MPs, as well as what occurred all across the country. Number one, there wasn't broad support. There wasn't an overwhelming support of people saying, we need to move forward with this, this is something we want. And of the discussions that were held with those that supported it, there wasn't broad consensus on going in one direction or another. And so the Prime Minister made a decision based on the fact that uh, there isn't the broad consensus to change a system that's been in place for 150 years and that will affect all Canadians without seeing that broad support that, as he said from the get-go, was needed in order to make this change. Now, guaranteed, um, there are some people who are going to wish that this would have gone forward and that they would have liked to have seen a change in the system. What we are going to do moving forward is work on some other ways that we can uh, improve on our system, ones that we've pledged to do in the campaign as well. Um, there was a, a law called the Fair Elections Act, um, which if you look into it has some serious challenges and many people have called it the Unfair Elections Act because it actually went against uh, too many people um, fairness in trying to get as many people to take part in our system as possible. And we've pledged to reform all of the aspects of the law that was put in place by uh, Stephen Harper's government that we feel actually work against getting Canadians to take part in the electoral system. A couple of examples. First, the Fair Elections Act actually limited the ways that people could identify themselves. And that was problematic. It was problematic because you had, for example, youth you had certain seniors, you had newly arrived Canadians, you had uh, members of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people all across the country who this actually specific component of the Fair, Fair Elections Act actually worked against because it was diff more difficult for them in some cases to get the kind of identification needed to be able to vote. So we're going to reform that, we're going to make sure that's no longer the case. Um, second, we want to make sure that we're giving all of the tools necessary to Elections Canada to be able to do their job um, in the best way possible. And that means giving them the resources necessary to inform Canadians about the election, to uh, figure out ways that they can get more Canadians out to vote, and then to ensure that they're doing everything they can to uh, have this kind of uh, umbrella organization that is overseeing our Elect our election process in Canada. Under the previous government, they were somewhat um, they were somewhat inhibited to do what they wanted to do, uh, and they were told not to do certain things. And I'll give you an example: um, the uh, voter information cards that were put in place um, by uh, previous governments were no longer in place under the Stephen Harper government. We're going to be putting them back in place. Those are the cards that told people where to vote. Uh, informed them of the elections, made sure that we were doing everything we possibly could as Elections Canada to make sure we got as many Canadians to the polls as possible. So all to say, uh, even though one aspect of what we wanted to do with uh, elections uh, and reforming the system is not going to be moving forward, and the Prime Minister removed that from the mandate letter of Minister Gould, we are going to be moving forward and working diligently on many other aspects of the electoral system excuse me, in Canada to make sure that we're doing everything we can to have an equal playing field for all Canadians to be able to take part in uh, the electoral system and, and voting. So thank you very much, Brianna, for that question. Um, I believe I have, I have another question along the same lines. Um, this one is in French. C'est une question en français qui vient de Yves à Thérèse Vaudreuil. Um, il veut savoir, il y a encore moins de consensus sur les oléoducs, uh, mais vous acceptez des projets quand même. Quelle est la vraie raison de l'abandon de la promesse de réformer le mode de scrutin? Mais merci beaucoup Yves pour votre question. 
Um, comme je viens d'expliquer en anglais, il manquait un consensus national, il manquait l'appui nécessaire pour vraiment mettre en place un, un changement qui, qui va changer la façon que 37 millions de Canadiens votent. Um, il y a une différence entre les oléoducs puis euh, de changer un, un système électoral qui va avoir un impact sur le pays au complet. Um, comme je viens d'expliquer en anglais, on a fait euh, beaucoup en 2016. On a travaillé euh, très fort pour parler avec des dizaines de milliers de Canadiens à des assemblées locales que nous, en tant que députés, on a organisées dans nos propres comtés. Il y avait un comité qui a été formé dans les chambres de communes avec des représentations de toutes les parties qui ont euh, eu des assemblées locales euh, dans les, euh, les différentes villes à travers le pays. Mais après, quand ils ont fini, ils ont, euh, ils ont, euh, on a reçu en tant que gouvernement un rapport du comité et on voyait qu'il n'y avait pas un consensus sur un système euh, alternatif de le système actuel. Et aussi, euh, ils mentionnaient que euh, ils ont dit que, d'après eux, la meilleure chose à faire, c'est d'avoir un référendum. Mais ils n'ont pas donné la question. C'est-à-dire qu'ils n'ont pas donné euh, la rétroaction nécessaire pour nous montrer qu'il y avait l'appui pour euh, une autre façon de voter. Et ils n'ont pas donné la question à poser aux Canadiens. Ça pose beaucoup de défis. Et si nous, comme gouvernement, on va changer le mode de scrutin qu'on a utilisé depuis euh, le 1867, 150 ans, le premier ministre voulait avoir l'appui nécessaire pour faire les changements, mettre en place les changements, puis on n'a pas vu ce consensus qu'on avait besoin pour, euh, pour euh, mettre en place ces changements. Um, comme j'ai expliqué, c'est dommage, il y a des Canadiens qui voulaient avoir des changements, mais malheureusement, nous en tant que gouvernement, on n'a pas vu qu'est-ce qu'on voulait avoir euh, comme euh, consensus, comme alternative, et c'est pour ça que le premier ministre a pris la décision de euh, dire euh, Minister Gould, de mettre le focus sur les autres changements qu'on veut faire au, au lieu de mettre le focus sur euh, le changement de, de la façon qu'on vote ici au Canada. D'abord, merci beaucoup pour votre question, euh, Yves. OK, next question is from a lot of people. This is another one that we actually received a lot of questions about. Um, and it's a question about the Prime Minister uh, not responding to a question in English that was asked in English in Sherbrooke at one of the town halls that he had done on his national tour. Uh, specifically, what is your feedback and why did the Prime Minister do this? So, thanks to all of you who submitted that question. There were a bunch of you who did. Um, you know, the only thing I can say about that is I've had uh, the privilege of, of working alongside the Prime Minister um, not only over the last year and a couple of months as his Parliamentary Secretary, but also during the campaign and even, uh, you know, just before the campaign after I won the nomination in our writing to be the official candidate. And one of the things that I was always inspired by, if you will, was the fact that the Prime Minister went out of his way to ensure that he promoted bilingualism all across the country, regardless where he was. And he's very proud of the fact that he can speak to Canadians in both official languages. So if he gets a question in French, he takes pride in the fact that he can respond in French and the same thing in English. Um, I had, you know, just a couple weeks ago, I was in Calgary with the Prime Minister at one of his town halls when we were hosting the Prime Minister's Youth Council. Two things, all the meetings that we had with the Prime Minister with the Youth Council, which represent 26 young people from all across the country that speak English and French, any question he received from them he responded in the language that they posed the question. Uh, at the, um, the uh, town hall that I was at, um, he made sure that if there was any questions in one particular language, whether he was at the town hall or out in Calgary, speaking to Francophones in Calgary that, uh, that were there, he responded in the language that they asked. So the Prime Minister actually has gone out of his way and takes pride in promoting bilingualism and ensuring that anyone who asks a question in a particular language gets the response in that language. So. I think it was a shock to a lot of people when the Prime Minister didn't respond to that uh, woman who had posed the question about mental health uh, services and so forth when he responded in French. And the Prime Minister came out, um, and not many people saw this, and stated uh, that in retrospect, and these are in his words, in retrospect, I should have definitely put more of an em emphasis 
on ensuring bilingualism and more bilingualism at that town hall, which took place in Sherbrooke. Um, so he right away made that statement and acknowledged the fact that he should have done this. Um, in addition to that, he actually hosted a town hall yesterday uh, with a couple of, it was I think with the Universities Canada, it was the university students, uh, and a question was asked, the same question, and he apologized. He said, yeah, I made a mistake. Uh, it's not something the Prime Minister does. And for anybody, regardless of, of whether or not you supported the Prime Minister uh, in the last election or not, um, the reality is that, you know, if you know this Prime Minister, if you know his history, this is a man that takes uh, great pride in being able to speak um, perfectly in French and English to both Francophones and Anglophones, uh, and we'll continue to work hard to do that moving forward. Uh, and it's an inspiration for me to do it as well. Um, you know, being able to respond even tonight in this town hall in French and in English is something that I take great pride in and I'm working hard to become even more fluent in both languages to be able to ensure that I can um, deliver a message in both languages the way I want to deliver a message, you know, the way that I would like to to communicate with people in our community. So um, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, the seventh question uh, tonight is in regards to refugees. And it comes from Lindell in Vaudreuil, Dorian. Uh, the question is this, what are the plans to sponsor refugees in your riding? Where can I volunteer to make this happen? That's a very good question. Um, that's a very open-ended question, so I guess I can uh, take a little bit of leeway with that and talk a little bit about the whole process if you'll permit me to do so. Uh, there are two different components to our refugee uh, resettlement plan uh, that are important to note. There's a plan that we announced during the election in 2015 where we pledged to, um, to allow for 25,000 Syrian refugees to immediately come into Canada by Christmas. We didn't meet the Christmas deadline. We actually, uh, it took us a little longer. Uh, we wanted to make sure we did our due diligence, that we went through all of the steps necessary, working with um, the United Nations, uh, working with uh, different members, uh, different groups working in the field, working with the Minister of Immigration, Public Security, a whole slew of different uh, offices were involved in this. So we were able to do it by February instead of by December. I still personally consider it a huge success, and it's something that I think really demonstrates who we are as Canadians. So there's that program which is government-sponsored refugees. But in addition to government-sponsored refugees, there's also another program that exists which allows for Canadians themselves, uh, community groups, different organizations to come together to sponsor refugees and ensure that they're given the best possible chance at success when they come to Canada. And we actually, believe it or not, there's been overwhelming support for the private sponsorship, uh, particularly in our community. And uh, I, I know of a couple of groups that have already moved forward with trying to uh, sponsor a refugee privately. Um, and just like you, perhaps, you may have come up against a bit of a wall. Uh, the problem is that, uh, it's actually a good problem and a bad problem at the same time. There was such a large demand for people to sponsor, to privately sponsor refugees that the number that was established by the Quebec government was actually reached quite quickly. And so the Quebec government at that point said, okay, we've reached the number that we pledged to bring in through private sponsorship, and what we're trying to do now is we're trying to reevaluate what it's gonna look like moving forward. What are we gonna do as the Quebec government, and other provinces are doing the same thing, what are we gonna do as a province to uh, move forward and allow more community groups and people to come together to sponsor more refugees. I can't comment on behalf of the provincial government, but that's really where there's kind of a bottleneck, if you will, right now. The provincial government is working as hard as they can to try and figure out what their capacity is, what they're able to accommodate through budgets and through a whole slew of other measures they're taking into consideration. But the moment that I hear back about any changes to that, I'm going to make sure that you know, uh, I'll make sure it's shared on my social media page, but personally, uh, Lindell, I'm going to make sure that you have that message sent to you personally so that uh, if you're interested in sponsoring, privately sponsoring refugees, that you're able to do so. Um, I want to also add something in this because I received another question. I don't know if it's in here, so maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but I received another question uh, that I saw online over the last couple of days about why we're not seeing more refugees in Vaudreuil-Soulange, and that's that's a really good question. 
I actually asked that question last year uh, at one of my town halls that I hosted in um, in the riding in our, our community. Somebody had asked, why don't why aren't we accepting more refugees? Why isn't the government giving us more refugees in Vaudreuil Soulanges? And the answer is actually uh, pretty intuitive. Um, when the government establishes where they're going to relocate or or uh, you know put place refugees, they take a lot into consideration. They take into consideration whether or not the refugees will have a community whereby some of the people in that community will be able to speak their language. They take into consideration uh, the fact that uh, um, a lot of the refugees that are going to come in will be of limited means and the funding that exists for refugees uh, is actually quite limited. They don't receive a large amount of money when they come to Canada. They receive a stipend every month for one year, and at that point, they're essentially on their own. Uh, the good news is, is that a good percentage of the refugees, uh, a majority of the refugees within the first year will actually historically find the work that they're looking for, or find a job that's able to take care of them, which is great news, um, but they don't receive very much. And they also, and this is something not many people know, is that they also um, are obliged to repay the government for a what's a displacement cost, the cost that it, it cost the government to get them here, I believe it's twenty seven hundred dollars. Uh, they're they're asked to repay that money, and historically, statistically, over ninety percent of um, refugees are able to repay the the les frais de déplacement, as they say in French, what it cost for the government to bring them here, and they're proud to do it. So anyway, that's just a little bit of a side note. All to say, they're of minimum minimal means when they come here. And so we have to look at whether or not they're going to have the ability to get from point A to point B uh, with a certain amount of ease. So uh, public transportation, uh, is it something that's going to be available? As you know, in our community of the Bois Lange, we actually have limited public transportation. What exists uh, may not be conducive to newly arrived families. They may actually find it very challenging and not have the kind of public transportation necessary to allow them to flourish and do what they need to do to get themselves on their feet. The final point I'll bring up is they also do an analysis of the access to uh, healthcare. The reality is our community doesn't yet have a hospital for the community of Vaudreuil Sur Uh The provincial government has pledged that we're going to have one built. I believe it's by 2022. I'm just going to confirm with my team. 2022. They've already chosen the site. Um, for those of you who don't know where it is, you can find the information online. Um, they're putting in, they've had the funding right now to do all of the studies necessary uh, before the building, uh, the building of the, of the actual facility starts. So we're going to have that, but it's going to take five years before we actually see it. Um, so that's not conducive for newly arrived refugees as well. All to say, the reason our community hasn't seen a large number of refugees relocated, uh, like other communities perhaps on the island of Montreal and in larger major cities, is because we simply don't have the resources necessary to be able to allow them to get on their feet and establish themselves and do what they need to do. So uh, thanks for that and I hope you appreciated that little bit of extra uh, information that I that I threw in there as well that I thought was important. Um, on a une autre question uh, concernant les, les réfugiés, puis c'est en français, uh, pourquoi est-ce qu'on laisse rentrer les réfugiés quand uh, je suis en train, j'ai essayé, ça fait longtemps de faire rentrer uh, des membres de ma famille. Uh, mais merci beaucoup pour uh, la question. Um, les réalités que on travaille, c'est deux, deux choses complètement différentes. Um, on a un programme et un ministère qui travaille spécifiquement sur les réfugiés, puis on a un autre bureau qui travaille sur l'immigration. Um, on a mis en place des changements. Uh, en même temps de uh, notre programme pour laisser rentrer des réfugiés, on a vu qu'il y avait un problème avec, uh, avec les dizaines de milliers de familles qui voulaient faire rentrer des autres membres de leur famille, puis c'était vraiment dur et très difficile. On a fait deux choses depuis qu'on est rentré en pouvoir. Premièrement, on a, on a annoncé récemment qu'on va augmenter le nombre d'immigrants qu'on va laisser rentrer au Canada de 250 000, 300 000. C'est une augmentation de 20 Ça commence en janvier 2017, cette année. Ça va aider à euh, laisser rentrer les membres des familles euh, 
comme dans votre cas, euh, peut-être que vous attendez très longtemps pour euh, avoir euh, la, la place, les disponibilités. Et on va essayer de régler le problème avec une augmentation de 50 000 personnes additionnelles des immigrants qu'on va laisser rentrer. Mais deuxièmement, le temps que ça a pris pour faire rentrer, pour faire euh, régler tous les dossiers, avant c'était entre 24 mois ou 25 mois, c'est ça? Conformé avec mon équipe? 24 ou 25 mois. Pour nous, c'était trop long. Euh, on voit qu'il y a des aspects positifs de euh, faire de réunification des familles et on a travaillé pour couper ça en deux. Au lieu d'attendre à peu près 24 ou 25 mois, maintenant, tous les, euh, tous les familles qui veulent faire rentrer les autres membres de leur famille vont attendre à peu près un an. D'abord, c'est du bonne nouvelle. Euh, J'espère que ça va vous aider aussi. Et si vous avez des questions concernant l'immigration ou si on peut faire quelque chose dans mon bureau, c'est un grand partie de qu ce qu'on fait dans notre bureau, euh, n'hésitez pas de contacter euh, des membres de mon équipe. Euh, qui va, ça va être un plaisir pour eux de, de vous aider et de vous servir. Alors, merci beaucoup pour votre question. Euh, J'ai une autre question ici. Ça, c'était le... J'ai déjà... Ah, OK, ça c'est une autre question concernant les réfugiés, je pensais, je pensais que c'était la même question. Non, ça c'est une autre question, euh, c'est concernant, c'est Lise à Pinko. Euh, la question est, comment justifier que vous donnez plus d'argent aux réfugiés que comme supplément de revenus garantis? Et merci beaucoup Lise pour votre question. Euh, J'ai reçu cette question aussi, euh, j'ai un comité... Euh, euh, des personnes âgées dans, euh, dans vaudreuil soulanges que j'ai lancé. Euh, je rencontre euh, les membres de ce comité euh, une fois par trois mois, puis on parle des sujets, des enjeux qui sont importants pour les aînés, les personnes âgées dans notre comté. Et j'ai reçu la même question. Mais euh, la madame qui a posé la question euh, a, a dit qu'elle a attendu à quelque part, elle a vu en ligne que les réfugiés recevaient, je pense, 2000 pièces par mois c'est presque double l'argent euh, que les personnes âgées reçoivent en tant que supplément de revenus garantis. Euh, J'ai demandé où est-ce qu'elle a vu ça, elle a dit en ligne. Je pense que c'est le cas pour plusieurs personnes. Malheureusement, la réalité est qu'il y a de fausses informations qui sont présentement partagées sur les médias sociaux. Et euh, c'est dommage parce que ça rend notre job tant que des députés, en contre gouvernement, plus difficile parce qu'il faut pas seulement informer les citoyens, mais aussi répondre à des questions concernant le, le fausse information qui, qui, est présent, qui est présent, malheureusement. Euh, il y a des gens qui prennent le temps pour mettre la fausse information en ligne et partout, et euh, c'est devenu un problème parce que les gens ne sont pas contre le fait qu'on laisse rentrer les réfugiés. Mais oui, ils sont contre l'idée que les réfugiés vont recevoir le double de, que, de quelqu'un vont recevoir en tant que euh, supplément revenu garanti. Je peux confirmer maintenant que ce n'est pas le cas. Comme j'ai déjà expliqué euh, en répondant à une autre question, euh, les réfugiés reçoivent beaucoup moins que les personnes âgées au Canada par mois. Et c'est rien pour un an. Après un an, c'est à eux de trouver leurs emplois, c'est à eux d'assurer qu'ils ont trouvé une façon de payer pour euh, le loyer, pour payer pour euh, la nourriture, toutes les dépenses nécessaires pour vivre. Euh, il faut dire, l'argent qu'ils reçoivent présentement, les réfugiés doivent avoir des colloques, ils, ils doivent trouver des façons de vivre sans avoir beaucoup d'argent. Et aussi, et ça c'est un autre fait qui n'est pas vraiment euh, partagé, euh, avec euh, beaucoup de personnes, tous les réfugiés qui vivent au Canada doivent repayer euh, quelque chose qui s'appelle euh, les frais de déplacement. C'est environ 2700 C'est les frais euh, que le gouvernement a payé, c'est les dépenses pour faire rentrer les réfugiés ici au Canada. Et c'était le cas pour tous les autres réfugiés qui ont rentré ici au Canada. Euh, les statistiques, et ça c'est du bon nouvelle, montrent après un an, euh, euh, les, la majorité des réfugiés qui reçoivent l'aide du gouvernement fédéral ont, ont eu la chance de trouver un emploi. 
Et aussi, la grande majorité, euh, je pense que c'est 90% des réfugiés, ont été capables de repayer le frais de déplacement de 2700 dollars historiquement. D'abord, c'est du bonne nouvelle. Euh, c'est malheureusement la réalité qu'il y a trop de gens qui essaient de mettre la mauvaise information, les, 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 les mentis, c'est ça, sur, sur les, les médias sociaux, pour essayer de convaincre les, les, les citoyens que c'est euh, la réalité, mais ce n'est pas vraiment la réalité. C'est dommage, mais c'est euh, le cas. D'abord, merci beaucoup pour votre question. J'espère que ma réponse a clarifié la situation. Uh, et merci beaucoup. Um, I have another question here that is coming from Robin in Hudson. Uh, the question is as follows. We need help saving Hudson's unique sandy beach and its woods from development. It's full of wetlands and related animals and birds, not to mention a stream, magnificent tall hardwoods and beautiful beach. One of the few areas the public can access the waterfront and enjoy undisturbed nature. Can you help us uh, keep this lovely area pristine for now and for the future? Great question. Um, you know, this is, this is a question that's also personal to me. Uh, my wife and I lived in Hudson for a period of time. Uh, my mother, uh, the first place my mom and dad ever had was actually in Hudson. The first place my brother and I ever lived was in Hudson. Um, and one of the reasons why people move to Hudson is to enjoy the beauty that Hudson is, right? Uh, the quality of life that Hudson delivers. Um, What you're bringing up is actually indicative of a larger problem with municipalities all across the country, um, particularly smaller municipalities. They've been underfunded for far too long, and it's resulted in situations where there's aging infrastructure, um, there's no wiggle room for anything uh, to repair aging infrastructure, to account for the increase in expenses that a lot of municipalities have. Uh, many people don't know this, but over you know, 60% of all the services that are offered by any government are offered by the municipal government. So they have a lot of expenses. They have a lot that they need to um, put in place to serve um, their citizens. Uh, and they've been underfunded. What I'm uh, very proud of is the fact that we as a federal government are uh, pledging to invest historic amounts, $180 billion over 12 years, to provide infrastructure support uh, to provinces, municipalities, to ensure that we are rebuilding our aging infrastructure, but also that we're building for the future. Uh, now that's going to do a lot of things. It's going to ensure that um, we're all working together, the municipal governments, provincial governments, federal governments, to meet the infrastructure needs that we have across the, the country. Uh, in Quebec, and this is something I'd like to point out, this is important to note. All of the funding that uh, is given by the federal government in Quebec um, is something that is done by all three levels of government, the municipal government, the provincial government, and the federal government. So any project that goes through that is approved uh, in terms of federal funding requires the approval of the provincial government as well as the municipalities. So um, uh, I've had the opportunity since uh, I took office in October of 2015 Uh, to work with my team and, and arrange meetings with all of the mayors of all the municipalities, including Ed uh, Prevost of Hudson. Um, a lot of the uh, municipal councillors uh, who came to my office or I went to their office and we discussed infrastructure needs and it gave us a broad picture of all the infrastructure needs that the municipalities have and also a broad picture of the financial situations of various municipalities. Um, it's no secret, Hudson right now is going through a rough time financially and could benefit greatly from some infrastructure help from different levels of government, the federal and the provincial government. Um, we've already had some projects that we've identified that we're looking into whether or not federal funding could apply. And right now we're working with the provincial government, which needs to uh, provide its support uh, as to whether or not they're uh, going to jump in and, and ensure that we have all three levels of government together. Now, if that happens, it'll hopefully provide that kind of support that huts not just Hudson, but other municipalities need, but specifically Hudson, uh, to ensure that there's, um, there's a better financial situation where perhaps difficult decisions that are perhaps being made right now because of the financial situation that Hudson and other municipalities are in, um, you know, they're making those decisions because they simply are looking at the finances saying, 
If we don't make this decision, we don't know how we're going to see the kind of uh, growth that we need to have in our city uh, to pay for all the things we need to pay for. So um, I'm working diligently towards that. For me, my goal, and I said this uh, you know, during the campaign and over the last year, my goal is to try and bring as much investment from the federal level into our community as possible so that we can, um, we can help our cities uh, and we can help community groups and we can do all the things we need to do uh, to not only help our community grow, but protect all of those areas that we all cherish and hold dear. And um, in all sincerity and, 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 and uh, um, in all openness, one of the main reasons why we all moved out to this area. You know, people move to our area because we have such this incredible quality of life. So we need to work diligently to protect that. And Sandy Beach is, is a great example of, um, of a situation that is, you know, uh, obviously being looked at by the municipality, being looked at by citizens, by being looked at by community groups. It's an area of concern and, and my job at the federal government is to try and get as much money into our community as possible to help with those kind of infrastructure decisions that need to be made um, so that uh, you know Hudson and other cities aren't put in difficult situations. And I look forward to continuing that work moving forward. Um, how are we on time? Okay, so we got uh, eight minutes left. Eight, okay. Couple of minutes left. Uh, do I have time for like maybe two or three questions? Can you actually repeat the first question because we had a Wi-Fi problem because of the weather? We had a Wi-Fi uh, in terms of Energy East. Yeah. Sure. Um, I will grab it. Give me a second here. Um, okay. We actually received three questions about this. Uh, this one is actually from the Michael and Saint Lazar. Is that yeah, the one we're doing? Okay. Um, the question from Michael and St. Lazar was actually the first question that we, we were asked was, um, the Alberta pipeline that was in, approved included around 157 conditions, I think is what Michael writes. Um, who or how will we monitor these conditions? For how long and is it budgeted? Are these conditions unique for one project or is it possibly applicable to the Energy East project? Very good question, Michael. Um, I'll repeat it because apparently we had some issues there. The, we had some uh, projects that we approved. We had three energy projects that were um, put in front of the government um, by the National Energy Board. And those three projects were pipeline projects. One was Northern Gateway, another one was called Trans Mountain, and the other one is called Line 3. We looked at all three of them and we looked at the conditions that were put on the projects themselves. What the conditions are, are essentially recommendations on behalf of the National Energy Board to say to the government, we are, we are saying that this project can move forward based on their experience and their expertise on the condition that these specific guidelines are met. In the case of Northern Gateway, we looked at it, we looked at all the recommendations and the Prime Minister simply could not um, approve the project, even with the conditions, because it went through a very sensitive ecosystem in Northern British Columbia Many people refer to it as uh, the Great Bear Rainforest. And the Prime Minister um, said that this was not something that we could approve even with those conditions attached. We had two others that we looked at, Trans Mountain as well as um, Line 3. Uh, line 3 was much simpler to approve. The reason being is that it was an existing pipeline. And the proponents, the company, was essentially asking for the government's approval to build a brand new pipeline. So replace the old pipeline, which was decades old, with a brand new one. That for the government, for us, is actually quite positive. We want to make sure that we're giving the opportunities for companies that uh, you know, run energy projects such as pipelines, the opportunity to upgrade so that we're protecting the environment and ensuring or minimizing any kind of negative impact that could occur from the existence of that project. So that was one that we approved because it was simply replacing an older line. The Northern Gateway project was one that would take oil from Alberta to the BC coast. That's the one you're referring to. And it had 157 conditions that were put on it by the National Energy Board submitted to the government. The way the system works is that those conditions are put in place. And if the government approves the project, and in this case we did, um, the National Energy Board monitors that every one of those conditions is met. And the proponents, every time that they meet one of those conditions, has to show the National Energy Board that they've met that condition before moving forward. So, the 
The resources are in place. Our government is ensuring that the National Energy Board uh, has the resources in place. And then we're also restructuring the National Energy Board, and I'll get to that in just one sec. Um, one of the things that we pledged to do during the last campaign in October 2015 was to find the balance between economic growth and protecting and preserving the environment. And that's something that, having spent over a decade of my life working on environmental preservation and education, is incredibly important to me. So the economic benefits of the Trans Mountain Pipeline are $6.8 billion investment into the Canadian economy, specifically British Columbia and Alberta, um, creating 15,000 jobs, high paying, good jobs, middle class jobs for Canadians. Uh, that's great for the BC economy, which needs it. That's great for the Alberta economy, which over the last year has lost um, you know, over 150,000 jobs. So they're, they're definitely going through a rough time. Now, the flip side to that is protecting the environment. So there's three key areas that we're doing that. Number one, getting back to uh, the National Energy Board. The National Energy Board needs to be modernized. We wanna make sure that the National Energy Board, which is looking into all the projects, the, national, uh, the, pro the energy projects nationally, is the strongest it can be and given all the resources necessary to do the best job that it can. So what we've done is we've actually uh, appointed a five-member expert panel that will be traveling across the country and working diligently to modernize the National Energy Board and the environmental process, the review process. They're actually going to be coming to Montreal, I believe, in March, if I'm not mistaken. Just looking, verifying with my team, in March. Uh, they're going to be coming in March. They're going to be having a town hall, I believe, in uh, Montreal. And what my team and I will do, if we haven't done it already, because... Uh, I pledged that we would do it an hour ago, but I don't know if we have, maybe we'll do it after. Okay, we'll do it after the, the, the online town hall is done. We're gonna give you the information of where it's being held, the date that it's being held, and the time that it's being held, so that if any of you, including you, Michael, wanna go to Montreal to take part in that discussion, by all means, feel free to do so. I uh, may do my best, if I'm not uh, here in Ottawa, to make my way out there uh, as well. The second is protecting our waterways. We announced uh, an historic plan called the Ocean Protections Plan. It's a $1.5 billion uh, investment that is going to ensure that we have the best possible capacity to mitigate and uh, work to, um, to reduce any negative environmental impact and protect our waterways. Uh, that's something that is gonna be rolled out in the coming weeks, in the coming years, uh, and I'm very uh, pleased to see that, uh, that announcement. That's part of kind of a national framework of different things that we're doing in different aspects of our environment to help protect and preserve um, our environment for our generation and future generations. But third, some people will comment on the fact that, um, you know, what are we doing about GHG emissions, which is an area of, of concern for me as, as somebody who's worked in the climate field for quite some time. Uh, with this pipeline, uh, what are you doing to curb greenhouse gas emissions, particularly because uh, we, were, uh, we played an active role in getting an agreement in Paris to get all the nations together to cap our temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. So one thing I'm incredibly proud of, that took a lot of hard work on behalf of multiple ministries, including the Prime Minister, was that we were able to sit down with all the, the premiers of all the provinces and put together a national plan, uh, climate plan to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And that we were also able to put in place a price on carbon essentially putting a price on pollution. It's the first time it's ever happened in our country. Uh, prior to that, uh, it was great. Alberta, British Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec were already on board with different carbon pricing um, plans. This brings every other province and territory into the fold. And it's something that is, by putting a price on carbon, is making it so that there are market mechanisms that are working with the different governments, different levels of government, and different community groups and people who are all doing everything they can to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Now, the final point I want to add on this is, there was uh, somebody who commented on whether or not this was a cash grab by the federal government. This is something that if any of you are interested in the environment and you've heard this possibly from some, some people who are anti-environmental legislation and so forth, I really want you to share this message if you can. The money that's collected from the, the, the price on carbon doesn't, isn't going to come to the federal government. The agreement that we have with the provinces is that we will collect that money and it will go right back in to the province uh, for which it came. And we're leaving it up to the provinces to decide where that money should go. Whether it's 
uh, tax breaks for those that need it most, uh, who, um, you know, for, for whatever reason saw an increase in a particular product because of the price on carbon. We're trying to make sure that uh, that impact is mitigated for those who um, would struggle because of that uh, particular increase in any particular good. Or investing uh, in sustainable energy and alternative energies and different technologies that will help to create new jobs and new industries in different provinces across the country while also uh, weaning ourselves off our dependence of fossil fuels. So, all to say, I'm incredibly plan, uh, proud of, of the multifaceted approach that we've taken to ensuring environmental protection while also uh, growing our economy. That's the kind of delicate balance that we're working hard to achieve, uh, and we're gonna continue to work hard to achieve that, uh, that balance. So, it's already 8.02. I've got uh, one question here and I wanted to take one on Facebook. Do you guys have one that I can get off of Facebook as well? Okay, so why don't I take this one and then I'll, if you guys wanna choose one off Facebook, then I'll, perfect, okay. The last question that I will take from a question that was submitted prior to this evening um, leading up to this, uh, this town hall uh, is from Fred in Pancor. During the election, the Liberal Party promised to restore lifetime disability pensions instead of the present one-time payment presently enforced and this among other veteran military oriented promises. Regional offices are being restored, but progress on other aspects of the promises is not being adequately communicated. I voted Liberal uh, due to these promises and I'd like an update on the progress of their implementation. Can you update me on the progress of uh, many of these election promises, please? So thank you very much, Fred, for that question. I'm glad that we got a question relating to uh, veterans um, and there are a lot of them that live in our community uh, that I've uh, had the honor of meeting over the last uh, year and a half. And, even prior to that, uh, so thanks for bringing it up. Um, I actually asked my team when I received this question to do some research on exactly what's been done so far for veterans, and I'm proud of it so far. Um, I wanna just kinda list through some of these because you're, you're quite specific in what you're asking. So the first thing I wanna say is, you're right, uh, we pledged to reopen the offices closed by the previous government uh, that served veterans all across the country. Uh, we promised to reopen uh, nine of them. We've reopened seven of the nine, and we're actually reopening and we're opening a new office for a total of ten. We've opened seven so far, with three more that will be coming in the coming months. So that's really positive news. As of June 2016, Veterans Affairs Canada is funding a new operational stress injury clinic in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Um, the kind of overarching investment in veterans includes. $5.6 billion in our 2016 budget that was released last year in additional financial benefits and takes major steps to treat veterans with care, compassion, and respect. So $5.6 billion in addition to what already existed, which is a huge step forward. Um, where's some of that money going? I just wanna give you a bit of a breakdown here. First of all, when you're talking about the Disability Award, um, the Disability Award is going to, so far that's what we've announced, we're increasing it to a maximum of $360,000 from the previous $50,000, which is more than a seven-fold increase on what was given to veterans prior, which is fantastic news. Um, and also the earnings loss benefit will increase up to 90% of a veteran's pre-release salary. Uh, and finally, uh, we're increasing uh, funeral and burial programs for low-income veterans from $12,000 to $35,000. A lot of the money as well is going into the fact that we've hired 250 frontline employees that are directly giving services to veterans all across the country. So we've moved forward on a lot of our promises. There's definitely much more work to do and the Prime Minister would be the first to say that. Um, but we're moving in the right direction and I'm proud of the work that we're doing. Most of the feedback that I've received from veterans uh, in our community and veterans that I've had the honor of meeting with across the country are very pleased with the direction that we're taking uh, and we're gonna keep working hard to try and do more for veterans who served our country in one capacity and deserve everything that we can possibly give them. So thank you very much for that question, Fred. I really appreciate the fact that you brought this up. Do we have that one last question that I can take from uh, Facebook? So this, is, so this is from Chris, who is in Vaudreuil. Um, and the question is, I don't know if it's a question so much as a comment. Please do not let them raise the retirement age. I am 62. Um, I'm just laid off because of my job was absorbed into a new parent office in the US. Um, very sorry to hear that, first of all. Uh, I have a QPP of $611 a month. 
If I am lucky enough to get another job, we need more than the puny amount set for the old age payment. We've worked all of our lives, raised bilingual kids, and now we'll not even make enough to put a roof over our heads. Uh, the amount needs to be raised as well as left at 65. Well, uh, first of all, once again, I'm very sorry to hear about what happened to your job. Um, there are two things that I can mention right now. Uh, the first is uh, we have raised the guaranteed income supplement for seniors that need it most. I believe it's to $1,080. It's $1,000 extra dollars. It's 10% more per year. So it's up to, I think, $1,000 additional per year. So we've already done that in our 2016 budget. Um, but in specifically referencing your, um, uh, your comment about keeping the retirement age to 65 instead of 67, that's actually something I was very proud of that was included in our 2016 budget. So um, for you personally, the age has been brought back down to 65. And if you want to pass that message around to anybody that you know who shares a concern about whether or not they're going to be able to retire at 65 and start to receive uh, the benefits from the, from the government that uh, uh, we received uh, before the Conservatives, the, Mr. Harper's government, had made that change and moved it up to 67, then please share this message with them. It's actually really positive and we received some great feedback from seniors who greatly appreciate the fact that we followed through on that promise to bring the age of retirement back to 65 from 67. Um, I just want to add, I wish you the best of luck in your search for another job. Uh, and if there's anything else that my office can do for you or if you're looking for any other uh, questions, it'd be, uh, it'd be a pleasure for us to respond. So thank you very much for that question. En terminant, uh, je veux seulement um, vous remercier sincèrement pour votre présence ce soir. Uh, C'est toujours un honneur de répondre à vos questions et d'avoir la chance de répondre à uh, vos questions concernant les enjeux qui sont importants pour vous. Um, normalement, uh, J'aime faire euh, organiser des assemblées locales dans notre circonscription, dans notre communauté. Euh, mais la réalité est que je passe la moitié de l'année à Ottawa. Et moi et mon équipe, on travaille fort pour trouver des façons, euh, donc euh, des façons où que je peux répondre à vos questions, même si je suis ici à Ottawa. Euh, et j'espère que ce soir euh, est un exemple de le travail acharné de mon équipe. Um, de uh, vous donner la chance de toujours rester en contact avec moi. D'abord, merci pour vos questions. Um, je veux ajouter aussi que si je n'ai pas eu la chance de répondre à vos questions, um, d'ici la fin de semaine, je vais travailler fort pour répondre à toutes les questions que j'ai reçues. Uh, je pense que jusqu'à maintenant, on a plus que 150 questions qui ont été posées. Donc, on va travailler très fort pour assurer en répondre à vos questions d'ici vendredi, sinon lundi ou vendredi la semaine prochaine, mais on va travailler fort pour vendredi. I just want to repeat the same thing in English. I want to thank you all for being on this, uh, this town hall tonight. Um, thank you all for the questions that you submitted. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to find any possible way to be able to connect with you, which isn't always easy given we have 100,000 people in the riding and given the fact that I spend half of the year in Ottawa. So um, I hope uh, this was uh, just an example of the hard work that my incredible team does day in and day out to provide me with an opportunity to directly address your questions and your concerns. Um, if I didn't get a chance to answer your question tonight, I received over 150 questions um, for this town hall. I was only able to get to about 13 or 14 of them. We're going to do our best to try and respond. I'm an, I've got a lot of time set aside over the next couple of days to write responses to your questions and I'm hopefully going to be able to get those to you by Friday. And if I can't get to you by Friday, I will do my best to get to you by early next week. So with that, thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, I wish you all a great evening.